Can you imagine what it means to run a hospital without electricity? I couldn't until in 2008, I met Raisa. Raisa is a nurse in rural Bangladesh, and she actually runs a small hospital. It's more like a small clinic, in fact. And when she told me how at night when they had power cuts and women were still giving birth, she was holding the torch between her head and her shoulder while she was carrying out the baby. This was a very powerful image, and it struck me. It's, it changed completely the way I conceive energy, the way I perceive energy consumption, what it means to me. Raisa is one of 1.3 billion people who today, as we speak, have no access to electricity. They have no light. And as you can see, the implications are well beyond not having light. But for most people, 1.3 billion remains a number. And it's understandable. But before I continue, let me just give you a few promises. I will not throw at you another chart about CO2 emissions. And I will not tell you that you're a bad person. You've probably heard this enough. <laughs> I will not tell you what the world will look like in 100 years if we continue doing the things we do the way we do today. In fact, I will tell you what we can do today in order to prevent this from happening. And most importantly, I will not try to convince you to change. I will show you that if change is to happen, it will happen despite you, because it is desirable. Now, before starting, we all know change is hard. And I'd like to highlight a few elements in the energy world, why I believe that we're not seeing the desired change. So, if you are not the problem, what is it then? Maybe your environment is not conducive enough to change? Let's have a look at it. So first of all, when talking about energy, there's a huge disconnect. There's a big disconnect between you, the consumer, and this big wide world about the energy decision-making system. It's the, the technology engineers, it's the big companies, the big governments. They seem, this, this, you seem disconnected from it. They seem very far, in fact, this is how you feel. You feel that you have no say in it, that these decisions are being taken at this grand scale, and you can't really do anything about it. However, most people forget something very important, is that energy is so fundamentally important to all of us that we are already participating in it. And this is why today my topic is about behavioral change. Behavioral change is at the key of showing you that you are already participating in the energy system's future. And in fact, this brings you closer to what seemed so far away, so disconnected from you. In fact, as the well-respected aerospace engineer and former president of India, Dr. Kalam, has said, you cannot change your future, but you can change your habits. And surely your habits will change your future. And nowhere is this more true than in the energy system. Because we all consume it, we all need it, and by consuming it or changing the way we consume it, we are in fact already building the future energy system. So, this was one problem. Let's go to the second one. When talking about energy, we're having trouble understanding the numbers. What do they mean? And in order to make this point, I always, uh, when talking to my family or my friends, try to make an analogy. So, if I asked you, what are 10 euros or dollars or yuan, no matter where you're located on this planet, you can make sense of it somehow. You can uh, associate this to a meal, to your income, to your rent, to the presents you like to buy, etc. But you can make sense of it somehow. If I ask you what are 10 kilowatt hours for you, then probably the picture looks a little bit different. Maybe you will know if you've studied the energy bill, this lovely thing you have to pay at the end of the month or after two months. Or maybe you will have studied it because you're interested in it. But most people will not know what it actually means. I can give you a few examples. So depending on the country where you are, 10 kilowatt hours will allow you to watch TV between 30 and 70 hours, depending on how big your TV is. Or it may be boiling a kettle for two minutes 100 times. And I could go on and on for many examples just to show what it actually means. But it doesn't end here. If I asked you, what are 10 kilograms of CO2? Then probably most of you will not know what it is. It's not even visible. And yet, each and every one of us emits something like 20 to 30 kilograms per day. And it doesn't really matter where you're emitting it, because once it's emitted in the atmosphere, it stays there. It doesn't matter if you're in Asia, in Europe, in America, or in Africa. It's in the atmosphere, and it contributes to, to warming up the planet. So, 
Let's, let me talk about the third problem that I have, that we have in the energy world. We're having trouble with the way information flows. So currently, the way that energy systems, for instance, in your home devices, are set up, is such that you as a consumer need to make an active effort to go get the data, this big cloud, whatever it is, kilowatt hours, dollars, euros, doesn't matter. You need to make an effort, but in fact, it should be the other way around. The data should be making an active effort to go and get, to come towards you, and, and, and educate you, and, and tell you what it actually means. So, let's take an example. This is a smart meter. Um, many of you may have seen this. They've been dispatched over 300 million already, and the number is set to grow very significantly, very soon, over 1 billion in, in, uh, in, in 2020. They're great devices. They actually measure something very important. They measure your energy consumption, and you can see how much you consume. And it's been shown that people actually be behave, they change their behavior once they see that they, they're consuming too much, for instance. However, the smart meter exemplifies one of the problems that I mentioned earlier. What you see here is actually one flow of information. You need to go and make an effort to look at this white box, some of you may find it pretty, some not, that basically is showing gray numbers. They're, they're important, but you need to make an effort still and go get them. So, smart meters are great, but it's not enough. We need to make more efforts, one more step. And so, we started off saying that change is hard, but let me give you the good news. The good news is that change is already happening, however. And uh, to start with, I'm going to give you two examples from the energy world, where we can see that, that this change, this behavioral change, is already happening. First, Nest. Nest is a thermostat. A thermostat, like you've, you've, you've seen in your home, it basically is, it helps you to control the temperature, be it of your space heating or of the water. We all pretty much have one. But Nest is a smart thermostat. It actually learns. It doesn't only just monitor your energy consumption, but it also gives you a feedback. It tells you what it, what it means and how you can change it. You can use it from abroad. Uh, it goes to your mobile devices. You have an application. And it is very simple to use. You just turn it and you set the temperatures. And in fact, by communicating back to you, it also makes you save energy and money. Now, so how did they trick it? Why, why is, is Nest, for instance, so, so popular? In fact, there are estimates that they're shipping currently something around 100,000 per month, which, is, which shows that it's working. People want this. So how did they trick it? Uh, in fact, maybe I should be using an energy-efficient light bulb here to, to exemplify the situation. So they actually they helped to reverse this flow, which used to go from the consumer to the data, in the other direction. So they brought you the data in a way that you can conceive it, that the way that you could see, okay, today I changed it, and I actually don't need my, my thermostat to be on while I'm away. And Nest also measures uh, when the last person leaves. So anyway, this is, a, this is a great example. And in fact, Nest was bought up by uh, Google for a staggering $3.2 billion. So there's clearly a, an interest here for such devices. Now, let's talk about a second example, electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, you've probably all heard about them. You've, you may have seen or driven one. This is a picture taken in Oslo. And the case, study, the case I want to talk about is actually about Norway. Norway has seen an incredible increase in electric vehicle sales recently. In fact, to give you a number, you've seen between 10% to 20% in certain months of the new cars sold have been electric vehicles. This is incredible. And what you see here is actually these are all electric vehicles at a charging station. So people started investigating into, you know, how come that this happened? And uh, there's an interesting uh, survey that, that I'd like to highlight. Is, so they asked electric vehicle buyers, what was the main motivational element that, that made them buy, actually, cars? So yes, there were environmental concerns. People actually do feel good when they think that they're doing something good for the, for the environment, which they are in this case, if you consider that electric vehicles are, uh, on the passenger car size, 50% more efficient than conventional cars. And second, Yes, they also mentioned, of course, economic benefits because they had huge tax breaks, so it was competitive price-wise. But there are two other elements amongst the top five choices of, uh, that, that they have clicked in this, in this survey. And it was that they had free access to bus lanes and that they had also free parking. Now, you may think, okay, this doesn't really have anything to do with, with energy or environment. But in fact, these are small tricks that make people embrace the fact and make the decision that they're buying electric vehicles. Because it's, as a matter of fact, they do want to go to work soon, they want to have a parking space, and they don't want to just drive around. So this is an example how with very small tricks, you can actually bring about an important change, a lasting change. Because these are, these are important changes. Now, 
So we've seen change is hard. It is happening. So let's have a closer look now at what it is, what is the trick for change? So how come that this, that this happens? And so the first point I want to talk about here, of course, is I showed you two examples from the energy world. So you might think, well, okay, that's happening there. That's cool. But is it also happening outside? And the answer is yes. In fact, to give you a few examples, for instance, e-cigarettes. I don't smoke myself, so I can't really tell the difference, but I see that they've become quite popular. People switch to them. They, they use it. Another example, of course, is smartphones. Most people, I assume, here are using smartphones. No one forced you to buy smartphones, and yet you use it because it's convenient. It makes things easier. It, it somehow awakens some sort of desirability for you to, to use this. It, makes, it basically underlines the fact that when you're talking about behavioral change, why do you choose to do something differently? Because it's more attractive, because maybe it's cheaper, because it's easier. In any case, whatever it is, the choice you go for is something that is better than something else. And so when, when talking about this, I thought that maybe we could, we could push this a bit further. Let's imagine, let's do a thought exercise together here. So I assume most of you have smartphones. How many of you receive notifications from their social media. If you please raise your hands. I can see many, almost everyone. How many of you receive notifications from, say, their music player or other devices? I can see, I can see some in the back here. How many of you receive notifications about your energy consumption? One, two, three, good, good to see you. But basically, the picture <laughs> changes. And so, imagine you did. Imagine you had an application that actually communicated to you something related to your energy consumption, your patterns, your change, the, the behavior, whatever you do. It communicates it to you and it looks something like this. You just received a text message. For instance, today's report, you've just, you've just wasted two coffees worth of electricity. Or let's turn it positive. You've actually you've saved two coffees worth of electricity and you can use those vouchers in the, in the coffee shop at the corner. Or you, on an annual basis, you basically won your next plane ticket to go on holiday with your family. Or it tells you that today or this month you've been better than your neighbors. People like being told that they're doing something good or better than others. And in fact, this, this last example, a company called Opower is using this and they're very successful. They, they compare your consumption to your neighbor's consumption. And so just imagine what this would mean for you. So the importance of this text message, which looks very simple, goes actually beyond this because it underlines the importance of feedback. And feedback is very important when you talk about behavioral change. Because if you don't receive feedback, then why change? You have no way to, no, no tangible way of measuring it. You just say, nah, it doesn't make any change anyway. Well, if I, I change, I don't see an impact. I don't see, a, you know, no feedback. Why bother? But in fact, and, and a Stanford professor uh, called um, Professor Robinson said it in a very simple manner. He said, what you can count, you can also save. You can change it. So here... Let's imagine this application. In fact, this was uh, something that we developed during a hackathon. So imagine your home. Imagine this application called Own Your Home. And it shows you very simple with icons, you know, your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, you name it. And so let's click, for instance, in your living room. And let's imagine you had smart windows. You had actually windows that were smart. So they, they had installed some sort of timer that would, you know, Start whenever you open the window and measure the amount of time you leave it open. It would also have installed thermometers outside and inside to calculate the difference. And would actually be able to calculate the amount of heat that you would be losing by keeping the windows open. And then, of course, feed you back some sort of feedback, but in a, in a, in a way that you would understand it, not, again, in, in, in numbers that you, wouldn't, you couldn't make sense of. Now, of course, you will not stop opening your windows. You all need oxygen to live. But at least this will be some sort of tool that would allow you to choose when to do it. Or another example, let's take the showers. Most, oh, I hope everyone here takes showers. And uh, so imagine they had installed an LED in, that, is, that would be generated by the, by the water flow. And that would actually change colors according to the volume of water that you are consuming and the heat. So say, for instance, in the blue, you'd be in a neutral zone that you could set, customize. And that if you are below your average consumption, that your shower head will turn green and make you feel, okay, I still, I'm still below, I uh, can still continue with the shower. And it will turn red if you are above a threshold of your average consumption, for instance. And of course, feed you back in, a, in an understandable way, some sort of feedback. Now, 
These are just a few examples. I mean, be it shower, be it the window. This is just to give you some sort of general understanding or just to give you a, an image of what it actually would mean if your smart devices that you would have installed at home would communicate back to you, something that most of us actually don't have to date. And this is very powerful because it helps to address some of the gaps that I have mentioned earlier, this disconnect, the fact that you couldn't make sense of the numbers, the fact that it all seemed so far away, now all of a sudden you would have the tools in your hands that would make you understand it. And in fact, the impact of this is quite powerful because not only would it make energy tangible, you could somehow make sense of it, it would make it comprehensive, you'd be like, ah, okay, this actually means this. And it would make it desirable because if it increases your comfort, then you're likely to use it. I mean, people, research has shown that people like to invest in something that increases your comfort. So, as energy professionals, engineers, economists, academic, academicians, or politicians, startuppers, our responsibility is to design systems through the eyes of the consumer to, to actually integrate into existing habits such that you would you would change would become desirable. And most importantly, the change would happen despite you. So for those people who still wonder if someone tells you, okay, you're able to save actually 150 euros a year. Yeah, what's 150 euros? You know, for some it's a lot, for some it's less, it depends on you. But in, in fact, if you think about it, if you scale it, it means a lot. And there are lots of studies actually that have been done. To take an example, in the UK, we have 25 million households. If every, if every household actually switched, use, uh, switched from using dishwashers, washing machines, and, and tumble dryers at peak hours when the electricity price is higher, so they don't stop using it at all, they just stop using it at peak hours, they could save the equivalent of a whole nuclear power plant. And just imagine what this would mean extended to more people across countries. So this is quite powerful, and it would free up a lot of money. It would free up a lot of energy, of course, but it would free up a lot of money that could be invested in other purposes, education, uh, and you name it. It could be across, across the sectors of the economy. So this is quite powerful. I just said scale. It's important because when talking about behavioral change, oftentimes people forget that a small change would be part of a bigger change. And in fact, if you dissect big changes across nature or your life or whatever, it's often composed of small changes. And there could be no one else, nothing better than nature itself to illustrate this example. So just like, imagine every single leaf that you see in a, in a forest, to the process of photosynthesis actually transforms the CO2 into oxygen, which we all need to live. Every leaf is part of a tree. And every tree is part of a forest. And all of the forests in the world basically make up our lungs. And so, just like the leaf, this tiny leaf contributes to a big change, us too, we have the tools for change already in our hands. And if we start using them today, then we will make a lasting impact. Thank you very much.